to, to our um, Inverse Problems seminar. So we are very happy today to have uh, Bill Rundell from Texas m University. So in addition to being the director of uh, DMS for a while, he's been working on inverse problems in partial differential equations for many years. And we're looking forward to hear more about inverse problems from for fractional different partial differential equations today. So thank you for, for giving a talk, Bill. Thank you, Nut. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to do this. Um, it's always fun to give talks and always fun to give talks to different people. So I'm, I'm glad for the opportunity and uh, I will move on. There's a lot of slides, but the slides go very quickly. And so in part, I was assuming that you would be, uh, there would be a legacy of this. And so I, I put in more information than I can probably talk about, but that's okay. I can talk very, very fast. Um, and I will, I will make sure I get through things in time. So the, the title is kind of reasonably obvious in some ways, but I've got to define, of course, what fractional is. And there's going to be very broad definitions of that. And we'll see that as we go. And I should also mention, of course, that this work is not just mine, but it's joint totally with Barbara Kaltenbacher, whom I think is online. Okay. You are screen sharing. Let's see if I can, oops. Or I've got technical problems here about, there we go. So a long history about fractional derivatives. Even Leibniz had issues with this. And he came up with this definition based on the, the standard formula for integer derivatives and didn't write down the one that's there, but he didn't know what that constant was in front. That constant get verified in the next century by Lagrange, who pretty much was the master of the, the gamma function. And so th th this was a formula that actually appeared in textbooks in the early 18th century for fractional derivatives. Um, in fact, uh, there's a long history of this, but the history actually should go away from replacing a formula with an integer by a fraction and hoping for the best. So it turns out that we really want what you'd want is that there would be an application. And so the real definition, which is the modern one of a fractional derivative came in 1823. Um, Abel was looking at the turtle cone problem. You've got a uh, curve sliding um, wire. You want to drop a ball down the wire and so that no matter where you start it, it goes down to the bottom in the same time. This had been solved a long time ago by Huygens, but very formally. And so Abel took it up and provided a complete mathematical justification of it. And I'll go through that fairly quickly. He showed that the time to fall was given by, well, an integral from zero to y, where y is the height of a fractional power times the velocity dt. Notice what's here is in what's called the Abel integral operator. And I've written this down with bold. And now to invert this thing, which is what you had to happen because of that ds by dt, um, you've got a fractional derivative definition. And the fractional derivative in this case is take the function, differentiate it, and then fractionally integrate with that Abel integral. So there we go, 1823. Actually, he was also aware that you could have done it the other way around. You could have integrated first and then differentiated, getting a much broader class of functions. But um, this was picked up by Louisville, who did some really strange things actually. And Riemann took it over around about 1855, 1860, put it all in a much more rigorous background, totally unaware of Abel's work. So this became known and is still known as the riemann louisville fractional derivative, okay? So the way it's been written down here is the riemann louisville version, you integrate first and then you differentiate to get the broader class. The catch is if you differentiate a constant, 
you get a singular function. And physicists are not happy about that. So moving on, 1950s, um, the Armenian mathematician Jibrashan had several papers on not only the fractional derivative of a player, but the, the reversal of it. And he wrote a 1966 500 page book on the subject. And it's still, everything that we know about it is in that book, okay? Uh, the catch was it was in Russian and it wasn't actually translated for another basically 40 years or 30 years. So there was a gap and in that gap, it was rediscovered so-called by Caputo, but in connection with applications. So although it's sometimes called the Caputo derivative, this is really not correct, it shouldn't be. But Caputo, on the other hand, realized the connection with applications that was really missing in some ways in the work of Riemann Louisville and, uh, well, and Jibbushan, true. But um, so now we're moving on a little bit further and as a warning, the derivatives we're going to talk about are non-local. The product rule fails. That means integration by parts will fail. And that's a basic PDE tool that you don't have. So the analysis is going to be tricky from even the simple case. So let's look at fractional powers of operators in a different setting. And this goes back to 1960, where Balakrishnan said, ah, supposing you've got an operator, like an elliptic operator, generates a continuous semigroup. Then you wrote this formula down and it certainly works for alpha as a const, uh, an integer. And well, what do you know? Um, it also works for fractions. And this was very strongly used all during this period. Um, you can use semigroups, and this is what Bochner did too. His uh, more direct version um, was to take the resolvent that does the usual estimate elliptic operator, put it into a semigroup, and take a fractional power in the bottom line. See that T1 plus S? Of course, this is if S is uh, one, then you get one upon T squared and it works out quite correctly for what you'd expect. Um, the other one is you can take on a bounded domain, omega, you can look at Laplacian, it's got eigenfunctions um, phi n, eigenvalues lambda n, simply define the operator to be the fractional one, to be the one with the same eigenfunctions, but the eigenvalues are multiplied by power alpha. Then there's a pseudo differential calculus version. Laplacian has the symbol minus C squared in Laplace transform space. Okay, fractional Laplacian's got the symbol minus C squared to the power alpha. Mm -hmm. And you can justify this. And so this makes a definition of the operator. But again, notice this is terribly non-local because you're having to write down its Fourier transform which goes over all of space. And in that case, naturally, um, the solution isn't locally defined and can't be. And the other one is using finite differences and dividing by a power, much like the, the one by Bochner. This is sometimes called the Riesz derivative. And it turns out that, for example, the last two there are equivalent under reasonable conditions on the function u or f. But let's go back to Abel. Um, very interesting character, of course, but he did other things other than this. The thing called the Abelian theorems, and these are summation methods of the following type. If I've got a sequence and I throw it into a coefficients of a power series that's convergent for, let's say, r less than one, and then I look the limit as r goes to one from below, and if that exists, then I say that a n is Abel summable. So for example, minus one to the N is a good example of one of these things that works. Cesaro summability is similar, um, but there's a way to turn this around. And in 1896, Tauber looked at the converse of the abelian theorems. And his theorem was if AN is Abel summable, and I give you an extra condition to any AN goes to zero, then in fact, the series must itself converge. 
That NaN going to zero is called the Taberian condition. And so a Taberian theorem is one for which you reverse normality. And you can do that because you've given an extra condition. Um, there are many famous Tiberian theorems. In fact, 1896, the same time as Tauber, was when the proof, first proof of the prime number theorem was done. But it was a very complicated proof. And the first simple court proof was in 1914 by Hardy Littlewood. And then in 1935 by Wiener and Ikehara. And then in 1975 by Neumann, all of whom, Newman, all of whom gave short proofs of the prime number theorem based on a stronger prime number, uh, stronger Tiberian theorem. But actually, they're also extremely useful in the fractional game. So here's one by Feller, and it basically says the following. If you've got a Laplace function and you've got a Laplace transform, if you know what happens to the Laplace transform, as a function of s, as s goes to zero, then you know what happens to the, what must have been the decay of the function itself at infinity and vice versa. So it lets you reverse properties of decay of the function in the Laplace transform with certain conditions, okay? And here the Tabernian condition is very, very weak. It's just simply that it's got the uh, a steel cheese integral. Okay, so this is going to go fast. Who cares? Is there an application for this? Right? Or are we just playing games of fractional powers for the fun of it? So let's look at on a line. I've got integer indices 0, 1, minus 1, 2, and so on. And I've got a particle that jumps left or right in a given time frame, delta t, left or right at random, with equal probability of going left or right. Delta T is a fixed time step and delta X is a fixed jump distance. So I'm going to rearrange this by adding subtracting terms. And I've been very clever, of course, in doing that to try and make it look like it's finite differences now. And so when I rearrange it, this is my, my formula for the random walk model in one dimension. Now I'm going to take the limit um, as delta X and delta T go to zero, but go to zero in such a manner that the constant k of delta x over delta t squared, delta x squared over delta t is held constant. If you do that, then you've just derived the diffusion equation. Okay. But notice that the, the, the key part is you've got to couple the space and time probability distributions, if you will. Okay, so, now, let's supposing I'm going to be in a general case, it's not equal probabilities. There's a probability of going a distance lambda x. And so we've got a probability distribution in space. And we're going to continue doing this. And I look now what the moments are. Well, I'm going to assume the first moment's one. Second one is the power of C in the Fourier transform space is the mean. The second power is the variance of that thing, and so on. And I'm going to assume these moments exist for the moment. Um, simple cases, lambda is normalized, its mean is zero, its variance is one, and then there's what I get for its transform. Now, if X and Y are independent random variables, then when I look at the probability density distribution um, of the pair, it turns out to be the convolution. And so now I'm going to assume that steps are independent, I want to know where the walker has gone to after n steps. And when I do this and I compute this product now, because remember the random variables I'm doing at n times, I take the limit as n goes to infinity. And this is a simple calculus exercise. My Laplace transform, my Fourier transform is e to the minus c squared upon two. Oh, good. That's the one that inverts to the same thing. And so that means that the probability distribution here is simply a Gaussian. This is just a statement, in fact, of the central limit theorem. In fact, this is one way to prove the central limit theorem. Yeah. So now um, I want to continue this way. I want to correlate delta t to delta x. And if I do that again, 
by the same correlation with keeping the thing constant, then what I get with this is the fundamental solution of the heat equation comes out now as again, a Gaussian, but it's the X squared over four KT because I had X squared over T kept constant, okay? So very simple. Um, this also tells you that the, the, for a given fixed time, the Gaussian distribution with mean zero and variance is such that variance grows proportionally with time. And this is in fact, the, one of the four famous papers of Einstein um, in 1905, which he looked at Brownian in motion and gave the explanations for it. The other three papers are much more famous. He's MC squared, of course. The electron one, um, he won the Nobel Prize for, and the other one, somebody else won the Nobel Prize for. But it turns out, if you look at citations for these four papers, this paper has more citations than the other three put together. So not to be snuffed at. Okay, so now we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to now look for a more general case with a lambda x and a psi of t, both probabilities in x and time. And we're gonna go about now seeing what happens. I want to know where the walker arrives at a given time. Um, again, there's a mean of the time and there's a variance in the x. And if I assume that these two are finite, then you can go through the same calculations, a little bit more complicated, and you get exactly the same thing. You don't get exactly, of course, the Gaussian because you've got things that are more complicated, but you get something that behaves precisely as the Gaussian. And again, this comes down to the central limit theorem. So now I want to blow something up. I want to, for example, pick on time, and I want to assume that the mean winning time no longer is finite, but in fact, it's divergent. So the best way to do that, of course, is to get a specific example. And I'm going to take, instead of A over, um, it decays as A over T squared, it's A over T one plus alpha, alpha is in zero one. So now the mean no longer exists, multiply that T by psi of T by T integrate doesn't work. So now let's go through the same calculations. And if I try and do the same thing, I do my scaling again. Um, I take the Fourier and Laplace transforms of the things in both cases. I keep going. And now I let sigma and tau go to zero simultaneously keeping them fixed according to that ratio. And I end up with this uglier, I'm afraid, Fourier Laplace transform. Now the question is, what's the inversion of that? Well, you're gonna see that's gonna come up quite soon, but I'm gonna tell you the answer. It turns out to be a Mittag Leffler function. And um, we're gonna be over there. And the inversion of that into, from the Fourier transform is now a right function, we'll meet that too. And we end up with this M here, which is a special version of the right function. And it looks the same thing. There's the absolute value of X over T to the alpha power, but it's not exponential any longer. It's this right function. Um, and so when we do the same trick about looking at the ratio of the mean squared displacement and the time, play a look this, use the Tiberian theorem that I mentioned about comparing and you'll see that what happens here is that mean squared displacement is now proportional to alpha, where the K is your constant and alpha appears as part of the gamma function. This is called subdiffusion. There's also the same thing you can do in space, but it's much more complicated and that's called superdiffusion. And I'm gonna show you a picture of what happens in space. Picture on the left is a Gaussian random walk. It starts to that red dot there and it doesn't go very far. When you look at the same thing now with an anomalous diffusion, anything two is Gaussian, anything less than two is anomalous. This is 1.5. Look at how the particle moves and covers space. If I had to put down mu as 1.1, 1 
the space fillings here would be enormous and this whole Gaussian would appear in a postage stamp and the picture I have on the right would have to take up much more than my office. Okay. Okay. So now back to differential equations. Everyone knows that the relaxation equation of the derivative of y plus lambda y has got solution e to the minus x. What happens if I replace it with one of those Abel type fractional derivatives? And more broadly, what happens if I throw into my diffusion model and replace ut minus uxx by a time derivative that's fractional? What do I get? Um, well, the answer is you've got to wait for a bit and we're going to go back and talk about Mittag Leffler functions. And so the Mittag Leffler functions come from 1901, 1903 by the eponymous Mittag Leffler. And they're generalizations of the exponential. Their entire functions are one upon alpha type one, kind of completely monotone in the important cases for X is real and positive and alpha is between zero and one and beta is bigger than alpha. And that covers just about all the cases of importance from a physical viewpoint. Um, so it turns out you can check this. Um, take its Laplace transform of the relaxation equation using the Laplace transform, easy to calculate for the power series for the beta Leffler function. And you see that it's s to the alpha minus one over s to the alpha plus lambda. You saw that thing before. That's exactly what I got from the random walk model correlation. So now we use Fellow's theorem, and I want to know what function, Mittag Leffler, um, will have a power law growth at infinity that matches up with that Laplace transform. Well, you use Fellow's theorem, and you see that for any value for alpha and back alpha and beta, E alpha beta on the positive real axis of minus x and on the positive real axis behaves a constant depending on alpha and beta, but one upon x. Every Mittag Leffler function other than one, alpha one, decays only linearly. Aha. So this is fundamental. It says fractional relaxation equations, and therefore also subdiffusion ones, the PDE you get from it, or whatever that you might want to call it, fractional PDE, will only decay linearly for large times. Okay, inverse problems now. If I run the subdiffusion operator through some standard inverse problems, do I get different answers from the classical case? And if the answer is no, then of course this is boring from my perspective. If the answer is yes, I want to know what the differences are. And supposing it's quote better, then there's this idea of quasi-reversibility where you replace a given operator that you care about by one that's reasonably close, which in this case would be my fractional operator with alpha near one, but less than one. And maybe I can get regularization from this. That's gonna be the theme basically of this talk. So I've still got to tell you about the right function and there it's there in its glory. This again came from number theory. Right is the right of Hardy and Wright with the famous book on number theory that was standard textbook until very recently. Um, it was rediscovered of course several times by others who didn't know that this was there, but we won't go into that right now. One special case, the M function was by Minardi who's a student of, uh, of Caputo. And this just tells you the Laplace transform of this character is a Mittag Leffler function. You don't care about that, but you do care about getting the inverse transform, the Mittag Leffler function. And the answer is it's the right function. So this gets the fundamental solution now from the fractional case to be not that M with an exponential there, but M being this right function. What does it look like? So I'm going to look at a profile of the fractional equation d alpha t u minus u x x is zero on the real line between zero and one and look at the value x is a half from neutral condition sine pi of x. Well, it simply decays. 
The black line on the right is the exponential curve, and you can see it's an exponential decay. But all the other ones, alpha is a quarter, a half, three quarters, or anything, any alpha less than one, it's only linear. But it's not the whole story. Look at what happens to start with. This diffusion process for alpha less than one has exceedingly rapid diffusion initially, and then slows off to become only linear decay for large times. It's not uniform in alpha. The constant in front tells you that there's a difference, but the difference for large times is the same. The difference for small times is like t to the power alpha, or as you would expect, as alpha becomes smaller, this becomes a sharper cutoff, and that's what you see. So here is the fundamental solution profiles. The heat equation, a Gaussian, the fractional one, this is alpha's half, <clears throat> it's got a spike. There's a singularity in that, and it's fractional order singularity, and it doesn't go away. So anything that uses this fundamental solution as a Green's function will inherently have a singular integral, which is there to either help you or hurt you. It's going to help you in the sense that the inversion of that singular integral is better. It's going to hurt you in the analysis of it is if you would rather deal with the one on the left or the one on the right from an analysis viewpoint, this is an easy answer. So we're looking ahead to harder analysis, but maybe different answers. So let me just write down very quickly here um, some work of a very fundamental paper by um, Sakamoto and Masahiro Yamamoto, where they, they put this down into, into the framework of, of course, of Sobolev spaces. What it tells you is that here, that the sum of the H2 and L2 norms of U and the time derivative decay as T to the minus alpha in terms of the initial data. And there's many other estimates that come in too. So the question is, maybe all is not bad. Maybe the smoothness in the direct problem makes the inverse problem more ill-conditioned. And maybe then the fractional inverse problem being much poorer conditioned forward is more behaved, well behaved as an inverse problem. So everyone knows that the original classic problem that started off inverse problems as a bad subject was Judah Hadamard in the 1820s, who said the problems that didn't have continuous dependence on data were ill-posed, um, not correctly set and all the rest of it. And the prime example was the backwards heat problem. So let's go through the backwards heat problem and just see that. So I'm going to do on the interval 0, 1, an x, eigenfunctions are obvious. I didn't bother to normalize them other than by that. And there's the answer for the solution. So now I don't know the initial condition, that's the c's. I do know the final time condition at time t is 1 or time capital T. And I have to get from knowing the dn's, I have to get the cn's. No problem, it's trivial. You just multiply the Fourier co coefficients of your final time by e to the n squared pi squared t, and you're done. Now, if t is 1 and n is 10, e to the n, well, n squared pi squared n is 1,000. e to the 1,000 is um, rather large, and so there's just no hope of doing this. This is an amazingly ill-posed problem. So now, what happens? Well, same thing. Same solution, except the exponential gets replaced by the, the Mittag-Leffler function. Same formula. Cn is now 1 upon the Mittag-Leffler function times dn. How does that decay for large times linearly? So 1 upon a linear is a multiplication by a linear. All you're doing is multiplying your data dn by a linear function in n to get Cn, not at all very ill-conditioned. It corresponds to basically a two derivative loss from Fourier space, that's it, not bad. So all of a sudden now, the backwards heat problem is only very mildly ill-conditioned if you're in the fractional domain. 
So this brings up, is it the complete story? Is it always better? Well, you know what's coming next? Um, we're gonna try and switch the fractional operator in instead of the heat operator. Um, we're going to regularize, select the correct alpha value by some discrepancy principle and all should be just well. Well, unfortunately, things aren't quite that straightforward. If you look at the amplification factor, then indeed for large values, all is well, but for short values of time, it's not. In fact, you remember from the graph, the fractional case decays much more rapidly for short times than does the regular. So now it depends a lot on what your time is. If time is long, the fractional is great. If time is very short, it's even more ill-conditioned than the regular one. So um, low frequencies are gonna be a problem for the fractional case and high frequencies are a real problem for the other case. Can you be clever? So here's what Barbara and, and I played with. In fact, this is how we get into the game together by looking at this problem and then um, it became infectious and we got infected in, in uh, pretty serious ways. Um, and we've think written about a dozen papers by now on various aspects of this. So you can see how infectious it actually was. So here's the game. For low frequencies, whatever that means, simply invert the heat equation. For the next band to be determined, use an alpha one fractional operator. For the band after that, use an alpha two and so on. Use the discrepancy principle to choose the J's, the bands, and the alpha I's in that band and see what happens. So our inversion is going to be this to start with, exponential for small, sub-exponential that is the metag Leffler for larger and select K and alpha through the discrepancy principle. Good. So, this is the, we had double split frequencies, um, two bands, and we had triple and so on. And it seemed like, frankly, that triple was the optimal because after a while, when you get larger splits, the discrepancy principle has to work harder. If you get any noise in the data, it has to work really hard. And we found that we could almost always, unless the data was really frightfully bad, we could do better with triple and we could with, with dual. And, but four really, really didn't work. In fact, we just got the same answers again. It just put it back to triple. So anyway, here's a picture of the actual u naught, and the dotted line is just a two split frequency. And the um, dashed line is a three split frequency. Um, the value for T was 0 0.02 and the error was delta 0 0.001. I'll point out to you the actual function itself is, um, well, it's got a discontinuity in the derivative. You try and reconstruct that just from the heat equation and you'll get utter nonsense. So this is really actually quite effective. Well, this one, there's no hope of ever recovering that with the heat equation. I mean, look at the frequencies in it. So here's what you get from looking at the two and three splits. The three splits, not very good, but it is tracking it approximately, okay? And I said, you try and doing this with just a heat equation or any other regularization method that we know, you will not get this performance. So this is a wonderful strike for this idea of regularization with a fractional operator. Um, the tale goes on, but the story is not always as good. So let me just quickly go through other fractional powers of operators. Um, again, I went through this, I've pulled that slide into too many. So let me go back um, and talk about fractionally damp wave equations. This is where Caputo comes in. He was looking at damping wave equations from the oil recovery business and finding out that the decay that he was getting 
from the models that had normal derivatives simply didn't match up. So he was replacing the time derivative as the decay term, UTT, yes, and then a constant time is UT. He replaced that with a fractional power and that's where he got into the game and showed that this matched up much better with the underlying physics. Well, now there's a whole bunch of models that go into this and the models um, often can have, these are time fractional models, different places you put in. This is the, the so-called Kelvin model that Caputo looked at and made fractional. There's other ones with much more complicated multiple fractional derivatives. And then you look at space models, when you look at not only possibility of fractional in time, but you can look at fractional in space. And here the power of the operator is typically to be the fractional Laplacian on a bounded domain. So there's a whole bunch of models. And it turns out that these models are actually much easier sometimes to recover initial data or, or coefficients actually from the fractional case than it is for the non-fractional case. And I could certainly spend some time in this because Barbara and I have done so, but I want to move on because there's more to tell. Um, the inverse problem here, if the operator A is minus div A grad U plus Q, then the fractional damping ameliorates the large exponential decay. So if I take the fractional Laplacian, Instead of the eigenvalues going like n over two to the power d, they go like n over two to the power d to the beta. So the eigenvalues decay much slower in the fractional case. And this can again help you for looking at large frequencies, okay? And again, I've referenced something. So there's also the famous Calderon problem, which I will show you. The Calderon problem is, to recover the, the conductivity of a body, gamma of x, from measuring on the boundary Dirichlet to Neumann maps. Put in Dirichlet data, measure the Neumann, or vice versa. So the question that was posed by Calderon some 50 years ago almost was, can you recover gamma of x from putting in an f on the boundary and measuring the corresponding flux, gamma of x partial u partial mu? And um, the problem was open for a while. It was first, um, by the way, it, the problem is incredibly opposed and it's highly dependent on dimension. The Dirichlet to Neumann map gives you all things on the boundary of your region. So if you're RD, you've got D minus one times D minus one. So you get D minus one squared data to recover D. If D is bigger than three, the problem is formally overposed, but still very ill-conditioned. If D is two, you're right on the money. And if D is one, it's impossible. So if we go on, what's the question now for the Laplacian? Well, Laplacian can't do the following. I, if I've got U is zero in some set, I think it's Laplacian, it's, it's also zero in that set. I can tell you nothing about it in, the complement of that set. It can be anything. Uh, not true. There's a certain unique continuation property of the fractional Laplacian that says that if you in a fractional Laplacian vanish in a set U, some open set U, it vanishes everywhere in the entire plane or entire RD. So you've got not just um, the, the fact that it's a different operator, get very different continuation properties. And in fact, the standard Calderon problem gets moved away from the boundary because the boundary is not an open set. The Calderon fractional case gets done by looking at an exterior domain, looking at an open set, measuring in that open set, the Dirichlet to Neumann map. And then you can prove that if that's the case, using theorems like the one that's in the middle, then Q1 is Q2. And the proof is actually much, much shorter than it is in the regular case. And the proof is independent of dimension. So it's really nice. The only catch is this tells me that if I'm trying to measure 
something inside my desk here. I'm, I'm not measuring in the boundary of the desk. I'm going to measure outside the desk. And I want to recover what's inside the desk. So this tells you that I can actually do this in some ways by measuring stuff at the South Pole. Now, if you believe this as a physical model, of course, there's, there's some questions about things. But mathematically, it's really, really good. Anyway, this is the maybe the main thing I want to, to say, because I think it's it gets this thing not only into the fractional domain, but this is a problem that's not easy in itself at all, even the, in the, the parabolic case. Um, I want to recover. Um, I'm assuming that the elliptic operator L is known, so the A and the Q in the coefficients are known. And I want to recover now, not the operator or coefficient within it, but an unknown reaction term. So this is precisely the model you would be doing if you were playing this game with systems, and I'll talk about that shortly. And the system turned out to be a system of equations and we're looking for um, how the so-called COVID-19 virus would go. The F of U's would be coupled um, terms and you want to recover the model from your data. Um, of course, the number of times where this comes up is not just topical of the last two years. There's so many cases of reaction diffusion equations where you don't actually know what the model is on the right hand side. And you want to recover that model from data. And the data can be several things. One, I can measure a time trace going up in time or I can measure a final time. And these two are very different for this problem. Um, and so I've got the thing usually set in RD, uh, some subset omega of it, bounded to all the rest of it, smooth boundary. I've got uh, impedance conditions and I can measure data that's either a time trace, which I've now grayed out because I'm not gonna talk about that. Um, Barbara and I also have results in those lines but I'm going to talk about the final time version um, that we've been working on in various ways for the last uh, two or three years. The application here is not to follow a time trace of information, but you've got a census. Okay. So you've taken, for example, you want to know what the population density is, um, and you've got various censuses you've taken over the period Using that, could you recover what is the model that drove this? So in the usual undetermined coefficient problems, the equation is linear. Or any nonlinearity is completely detached from the unknown. The domain of the coefficient is known, omega, sometime. Regularity themes for the coefficient solution are usually, well, reasonably straightforward. And all of them fail. The range of a solution at time t is t may only be a subset of the range that's happened for t less than t, in which case your evolution problem has gone through a regime that you cannot measure the range over and you can't recover. That's necessary condition to put in. If f is simply c0, the solution is maybe c2, uh, it doesn't work even in the parabolic case. You have got to go into Schauder space to do that or into Sobolev space. Ah, regularity pickup is a problem here. And it's a real problem for the regularity pickup in the fractional case. The good news is the problem is less severely ill conditioned as measured by norms. The term F of U dominates the behavior and therefore is easy to detect. But this gives a certain tenuous instability to the problem and what I'm going to talk about from basically the rest of the talk is how this comes in. That is, do I still get uniqueness um, in both cases? How ill-conditioned is one? And can you regularize the same way we did with the backwards heat? So I've got to tell you about the difference between pre-existing data. You can't just tell me I measured something and here it is, what can you tell me about F? You've really got to choose your data here so that the maximum temperatures occur on your measurement set. That you can usually do, but you can't just pick any old data. You have to do that in your measurement set because the range of your measurement for the function f has to be 
at least as large as it occurs anywhere in the whole domain. So there's two natural approaches. Um, you can look at the map F, which goes to your final data, use Newton, Newton Halley, any of these methods that um, we love and Barbara and I are big fans of both of them. Or we can evaluate the PDE on the surface and solve iteratively for the unknown F. And we'll go through them. Ah, so now we're going to write down the solution to the direct problem. And of course, we have to throw away the exponential and throw in instead the Vitag Leffler function with all its attendance issues. We've got evolution operators we have to go through. Um, we need estimates on them. And for those who look at the slides afterwards, this slide's important because it tells you that in the fractional case, you get a very different condition here than you do in the, um, in the regular classical. So the classical one tells you that you get infinite smoothness coming in. That is your decay in time is Q minus P, P is bigger than Q, and it decays like that for any P bigger than Q. And in the fractional case, there's a bound in how much it goes. That's because in the parabolic case, it goes exponentially fast. In the fractional case, it goes with a fixed linear decay. And that's what this theorem tells you. And the difference of two there comes about because of the, um, actually the, the two with, with an alpha attached to it, comes about by that one linear decay being transferred into space norms. So if we project onto this boundary, we get a map and we're going to throw in a guess for F and we're going to iterate and see what happens. So we've got a range condition that's going to be there. We now have to set spaces up and you'll see that I've started to write this down, but it gets progressively more gray as it goes until it fades out. That's because I left it there so you can read it later on, but you're not supposed to read it right now because this is a complicated space with complicated pieces in it. And um, we would apologize except it's needed to get the answer. And so here's the theorem. If alpha is one, classical, assume F1 and F2 in that space I grayed out, then with various conditions on F1 and F2, you get the fact that you get this estimate. It's fabulous. It tells you that in the H1 dot norm, it's a contraction for large enough T. In fact, the contraction constant should be wonderful for you because it's an exponential in there based only in the first eigenvalue lambda one and T. And if T is at all large, that's going to be wonderfully contractive. So there we go. There's a T star such if T is bigger than T star, there's at most one fixed point and the solution is unique in that space W. Success. Um, <clears throat> in the classical diffusion case, uh, we had problems. If alpha is nearly one between four fifths and one, um, if the data G is strictly monotone and well, then you can show the operator T is a self mapping of some con convex set B. And you can show that it's got a fixed point for F and B. And if this fixed point does other things, monetarily decreasing, then you can show that it actually solves the inverse problem. But uh, there's a big difference in what we can prove. So the difference here comes down to purely technical difficulties involved in the analysis. In the one case that Rapid exponential decay takes care of things. In the other case, the lack of regularity for one and the fact you don't have exponential decay for another causes considerable problems about trying to apply this theorem. Now, it turns out when you run the reconstructions, there's almost no difference with respect to alpha. Yeah, there's some, but it actually depends on how large a time you take T 
as you might expect, because the difference of, you know now for large T, one behaves differently from the other. But by and large, things are much the same. So here's some reconstructions of, um, this is the Zeldovich um, triple cubic, um, tri triple power cubic that comes into chemical combustion theory. So we took an actual model we put in nice constants. Left is 1% noise and it converges really well. Theorem holds up. There's only a, a, basically a one degree loss, a one derivative loss here. With 5% noise, with good regularization, it still converges pretty rapidly. And of course, it doesn't quite get the solution, but it's, it's pretty good. Um, so here's a pretty complicated function again. This is the initial data function in some ways that um, I had before with the, with the spike in it just reversed, using that for, for the function f. Um, it's not going to be easy to get this thing. Well, not, not true. 1% noise. This is reconstruction. This is again the reconstruction from um, alphas 1. But if alpha is near 1, you're going to get the same picture. Um, here's the alpha dependence. If alpha is small, the, you look at the decay of the first iterate minus the exact over the exact, you see it decays much more rapidly, in fact, for small alpha. And in the end, if alpha is near one and for large times, then it does poorer. Well, that's, that's not surprising. This is exactly what you'd expect. So this tells you basically the performance here is actually for the most part um, better with smaller alpha than it is for larger alpha, in particular for T. Um, Newton, ah, well, here's the same picture with Newton um, with the two pictures I, I had of these functions. Sorry to say Newton doesn't do nearly as well. It's outperformed totally by the iteration scheme. Um, too bad. Um, and I'll quickly show you reaction diffusion systems where there's an F1 and an F2. Um, the coupling is UV. We've tried various other couplings. We have tried the models that can UV squared and U squared plus V squared and so on. And they're in one of the papers that I've mentioned. If beta is negative, then this is a competing species. And if beta is positive, it's symbiotic. Beta magnitude represents the coupling between the two terms. Okay. Um, so here's an example of F1 and F2. F1 is smooth, F2 is not so smooth. That's the one you've saw, seen before. And there's a covering of F1 and F2. It's much better if it's the beta minus one, which is the competition. And in symbiotic, then the, it's still very good reconstructions, but much slower convergence. Again, nearly independent of alpha. Um, so, there's lots of other problems here. We've looked at um, the Vestavelt equation, which is an, a nonlinear wave equation. We've tried to recover terms like uh, the initial data. We've tried to recover coefficients like the wave speed, and we've actually recovered the nonlinearity from that too. There's a huge number of problems out there. Um, and it's an interesting topic simply because uh, you get sometimes quite unexpected results by using different alpha values. And sometimes it's a good regularizer and other times it's not. So the answer is there's no answer to the question in general, but it's a lot of fun to go and play with this stuff. And I thank you for your attention. Great. Thanks a lot for, for a great talk, Bill. Uh, so, um, uh, if you have any questions, uh, now you can uh, you can unmute yourself uh, and ask uh, ask questions. Uh, by the way, since Barbara is here, and I gave the talk, Barbara will answer the questions. <laughs> Good. Okay, well, uh, I think you have a question. Um, 
Well, I, I had a question. So, so you focus I'll, here I'll on. Answer. I'll try and answer it. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, uh, you focused on on the fractional derivative as a regularization mm -hmm. uh, approach, mm -hmm. but you also mentioned that in in the damped wave equation, it yeah. sort of comes from observations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so somehow there is some uh, some underlying physics that creates this this fractional behavior. Uh, so, so what is your take on on the type of what are what are the physics that that generates this uh, this type of behavior either in this problem or other problems? So you know, I, I've I've some ways downplayed the contribution of Caputo, um, and we have in our papers in some ways we've we've mentioned Jibashan um, more than Caputo, but what Caputo did here was actually quite fundamental. He didn't invent these derivatives. He didn't invent any of the any of the theory behind them or anything else. Um, that was all done um, before. I mean, and and the, as the, the idea goes back to 1823. But he realized that the, the damping models for the wave equation in reservoir modeling, because he was, he was interested in, in that. In fact, Caputo was a faculty member at Texas A&M University for a while in the geophysics department. Um, the models simply didn't work. The, um, he, and they also were independent of frequency. Every frequency was damped exponentially. So he didn't believe this. And so he looked for a model that would allow for a frequency dependent damping for one and one that wasn't so severe. And uh, ergo the fractional one. Actually, he didn't really do that. He looked at the Laplace transforms and realized that if he put a power in there to an alpha less than one, and he inverted it, um, he knew a little bit about Tiberian theorems. I mean, he, he's a pretty good mathematician as well as a geophysicist. Then he would get different decays and he'd get what he wanted. So he, he engineered the mathematics to fit what he wanted in his models. And that I think is his big contribution. And, it, and, it's, and it's really a really big contribution. But um, he did not invent fractional derivatives in any way or any, any, anything at all. And so the, those, he studied the fractional relaxation equation in some detail under various different models and showed that there's actually a, a fast decay and there's a slow decay. And that slow decay depends strongly on alpha. By and large, the constant outside depends on alpha. And it's always linear decay, but it depends strongly on the value for alpha. And um, it corresponded a great deal to also the observation on the random walk. Because when an, you're in a porous medium and you've got an oil particle, it doesn't flow uniformly between, let's say, the sand and very fine sand or clay and pebbles. It gets stuck at the pebble. And in that medium, it doesn't just jump like that equal time. In fact, there's very long waiting periods before the particles do this. And that waiting period is impossible. The waiting period has to be, at least if you use with a probability density distribution that has a mean that is integrable, then you get back to, to Brownian motion. And this was not Brownian motion. There were really long, time delays. And that also was something he discovered wasn't the case for the fractional. And that gave him another lead into why this was probably a good idea. Um, in the case, if you bust the space part and don't have a finite variance, then you get arbitrary long jumps. And this comes in physically too, because, um, and again, this is documented in the literature, people have done this, they look for um, grazers, like a cow. They put it in a field, and if they make the, the cow think it's a Brownian cow, it's going to stay where it is and take short little moves and, and, and exhaust all the grass nearby. But if it's willing to go for a wander at some point and take a large jump, then it'll find new grass. And so when you look at grazers, what they do, they graze locally, and then they move a large distance. And people have actually worked out 
for different grazing species, monkeys and trees who do the same thing in a, in a 3D environment, what the beta is <laughs> less than two of that model. So the random walk one is pretty important and it ties in the physics. The fact is that these fractional Abel type derivatives are ugly, right? I mean, the, the, well, they're ugly in the sense the analysis is uglier. You don't have the usual theorems that you expect. You don't have integration by parts through these derivatives. They're non-local. And one way to put it is, do you believe in Brownian motion? Brownian motion says that if you are a walker, Every walk you do, every step is independent from the last, okay? It's a Markov process, it only depends on the last one. So if you've done a lot of independent steps and haven't kept track, how can you reverse your steps to go back in time without being terribly ill-conditioned? But if you kept track of the steps through the integral average, right? Then you know, what. What, you, what steps you made, it's non-local. You just retrace them, it's no longer Markovian. And so you can reverse time. So that's the other way to think about this is that if you don't believe that every model is Brownian motion or a Markov process, that one with a history mechanism in space or time, the best way to implement this mathematically, well, not best way, but a good way to do it is by going to fractional operators. And that's what people have been doing. Great, thanks. Can I also comment actually to that uh, yeah. very nice talk? And so, and be in question. So, in fact, this fractional derivative for wave fractional dumping in wave mm -hmm. equation, it's particular case of so called cold, cold, cold model, mm -hmm. which you have a coefficient is like rational function of fractional frequencies. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's originated in electromagnetics. In electromagnetics, you have this in this electromagnetic this, uh, wave propagation with dispersion. Mm -hmm. Also, models. in acoustics. Yeah, also in acoustics, they use it to its viscoelasticity. Yeah, yeah. elasticity. So it's a very common model. In mm -hmm. fact, we you, we are using this model for our like for our project because mm -hmm. it's the most common. It's, it's so. Yeah, so, so have you tried any anything for this? It's a little bit more general uh, or thought um, of this. It's a little we, bit more general than, than fractional derivative. Um, we've looked at these models a little bit. Um, we've actually, some of the papers have, we've got a paper that's come out a couple of months ago um, that looks at fractional damping for these wave equations. Um, and there's some inverse problems in there too. This is basically an acoustic type thing. Um, and we're recovering the initial condition. And we can also recover the wave speed in one dimension. So, and it's really helped by, by the fractional part. Um, what we're doing right now is trying to recover objects within multiple um, fractional terms, like you saw some of those damping models of more than one fractional damping coefficient in there. And we're trying to figure out how can we recover that model? That is, how do we get those fractional exponents, their constants and everything else, probably together with, let's say, initial data. So we're, we're looking at these things basically all the time. Our problem is we'll get more problems um, then we know how to solve. <laughs> okay, thanks. And another question is, when you do this uh, reverse time problem, mm -hmm. for a standard parabolic equation, of course, you just need to, uh, you do it from one time. And in fractional, you need to have for some time interval, right, to trace it. No, 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 not necessarily. No, no, no. But you are, as far as I understand that your uh, Cauchy problem is not defined uniquely if you have only for one time, for one time. For example, you have data for one time, uh, your Cauchy, because 
Is it unique? Well, uh, you need to. I thought you always need to have some time interval. No, 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 no. I mean, so maybe this is another thing to to explain. Um, the fractional operator is normal. Okay, but there's always a realization of it, if you will, that is local, and the realization in this case is the. Fourier expansion of the solution, but not with an exponential in there, but with the meat tag Leffler function. Okay, I, I think I think I understand. I think yep. I and the same is true, for example, in the space fractional cases. So there's some you know, reasonably recent work, so like ten years ago or so, but more. Well, in particular by Caffarelli and Silvestri, who basically showed the following: if you've got a space fractional problem in R D that comes from, let's say, the fractional Laplace or something similar. There's an extension theme that lets you pull that into a local operator in a higher dimensional space. And when you're in a higher dimensional space, you've got more measurement capabilities. And so that tells you that you can solve problems that you can't solve in the original small dimensional space. And this is in some ways how the Calderon problem goes actually as a solution. And these are called extension theorems. And it's true even for ODEs. If you get an ODE model with a couple of fractional derivatives in them, then you can write it as a larger ODE system that's only got integer derivatives, but it's much larger. So there's realizations of these problems in larger dimensional spaces. And that's again, mathematically quite an exciting idea. Uh, but in your example, if I understood it correctly, when you have sort of uh, uh, uniqueness of continuation for fractional Laplacian problem, you still require your data given on some open set. It's yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah. By the way, neither Barbara, at least I don't know that Barbara's been working on this, she hasn't told me, but we have not been working on these space fractional problems. That's a, a, a whole business that's um, with Gunter Roman, Miko Salo, um, and so on. I've been, and Mati Lassis have been working on this for a long, long time. But um, we have not been doing that, okay? But we are interested in using the space fractional part to get, quote, a possible regularization or a better modeling of a model um, and that's where we're, we, that, that's what we're trying to do with them. We're not trying to do inverse problems for space fractional derivatives in the sense of what I, I quickly mentioned, but the call their own problem. That's another game. Great. Any, any other questions? So um, if there are no more questions, uh, let's uh, let's thank uh, thank Bill once again for an excellent talk, uh, and uh, we'll stay around for a couple more minutes if you want to chat uh, a little bit about about this this very interesting framework. So thanks again for for, for your talk. Okay, thank you. Perfect.